Thank you. It was awesome. Oh, how good it is to be here. How good it is to be here. You know, it wasn't always like that for me. It wasn't. It wasn't at all. I'm here this morning on a volunteer basis. I came to church because I wanted to, because it's good to be here. It wasn't like that. I was born and raised Catholic. Uh, I'm sure there might be some Catholics here, but for those of you who aren't or don't know how that drill went, we were marched off to school every day, and the first thing we did every day was go to church. I mean, from six years old on, and I didn't even understand what they were saying because it was in Latin. <laughs> Everything was, you, you go to church, uh, you go to church on Sunday, definitely, and people would sit around kind of like in a, in a zombie zone, I don't know, just kind of half there, knowing that if they didn't go, there was going to be some, um, some mark against their soul that they would never be able to overcome. I mean, this is what we were told. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I loved my Catholic upbringing. It, its pulses and rhythms are deep in my life, but I didn't have that same feeling there as I have here. But the bottom line is, as soon as I was 18, I was out of the house, and I was running away. I did not, you know, want to go to church. It was just not something I looked forward to. And then in 1984, on one of those obligatory church days, it was Palm Sunday, a friend drug me into church, you know, okay, let's go. I'm like, oh, right, okay, I'll go. And something very different happened that day. I was in the back of a very large and crowded church, and um, I started hearing the priest sing from way behind where I was, and this was unusual, uh, very loud and vocal. And on Palm Sunday, there's usually a little blessing of the palms and a little waving of things in the air. But this day was different. This priest who came forth was about six, two, or three, looked like Tom Selleck. Back in the 80s, remember those little tails they had of hair down their back? He had one of those. I'm like, what is going on? He's singing, and he has these big palm fronds like we had on Palm Sunday here, like the plants huge, and he had an altar boy walking backwards in front of him holding a large bowl of water, and he was dipping these palms in there and just swirling them out as the blessing instead of the little shaker that kind of looks like a microphone, you know? And as he walked past, he swooped that palm front, and the water hit me, and something happened. Now, I don't know that it was the blessing of that little dip of the holy water you referred to in your song. I think it was something that jumped off of him onto me. And that's how it works, isn't it? When we have the presence of God within us, something generally sparks it. It's as if we were born with this pile of dry kindling right there in our hearts, just waiting to be ignited. Well, that day I was ignited. It, it hit my kindling. Now, I could have let it gone, go out. I could have left the church, not gone back. But something happened within me where I had to have more of whatever that was. And so I went back, and I remember as I walked in to dip my hand in the holy fountain one day, shortly thereafter, there, was, there were little bookmarks there. And I grabbed the bookmark, and on it was this. And you shall seek me and find me after you have searched for me with all your heart. I grabbed it. I clutched it. I still have it. And that's from Jeremiah 29, 13. And so there was an instruction there and, and a promise. It said that I shall seek and find God after I have searched God with all my heart. And so there was that instruction to search with my heart. And what does this word search mean? An exhaustive, thorough seeking for something. Now, mostly in this world, when we search for something, we're doing it with knowledge, right? Our book knowledge. And so what I've learned in practicing the presence of God, that there are three components of it, and that's knowing, and then doing, and then being, okay? So a lot of people have their kindling sparked, by different means. They could be in a church service. They could be uh, uh, 
with uh, someone at the grocery store who somehow touches them and something happens. They could read a book. They could, these days, watch a YouTube video or go to a conference and hear a, hear a spiritual teacher. There are many means this could come across. But it's what we do with it. If we just read something or learn a little about it and don't follow it up, the knowledge does nothing because the action of God is at the heart level. So I thought about a few of these things that have happened. There was a book about 10 years ago that hit the kindling, I'll say, hit that heart space and touched millions, tens of millions of people all around the world. It was new thought knowledge, and it just, everybody hit it. And they made a movie, too. And so it was a movie the guys were talking about it because they could watch it. And it's, we know this, guys watch movies, women read books. That's not universal, but it's kind of true. So, so it hit everybody. And that book was called The Secret, okay? Now, all of us new thought people knew all about this secret thing, right? And we're like, well, what are you talking about? We know this. We've been doing this for quite a while now. And then everybody were, was talking about it. They'd come up to us and say, oh, have you heard about the secret? And, and we were saying, yeah, <laughs> been doing it for a while. But the bottom line is that fizzled out. And we don't hear people talk about the secret anymore, do we? Why do you think that is? Two parts. Number one. They left the divine power of God out of the secret, and that's, that's the propeller that, that stirs everything into creation. But the biggest factor is, is that people watched it, they got excited about it, they did it once or twice, nothing happened, and they quit. Okay? So we have to practice, practice, practice in order to find the presence of God within. So, again, the instructions are to... Search for me with all your heart. And there's another instruction to find the presence of God, that the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. All right, very clear. And where does God live? In the kingdom of heaven. So, oh my, God is inside of me, that presence. I've got to go there and find that. I've got to get in that. I've got to uh, do that. I have the knowledge that that's where it is, but how do I actually find it and live it? I've got to do something over and over and over again to get it, right? So there's a, there's a parable that reminds me of what happens. Lots of us are seated. And there's, there's a parable that Christ referred to, and I'm not going to get this exact, but I get it the way my little child memory from Catholic school remembers it. And that is that seeds will fall. They will be scattered. Some will hit a rock, and they won't take. Some will hit, uh, some of the birds in the airs will come and eat them. And uh, some of the seeds will fall in a little crevice, and they'll take root, but then they'll die because there's no depth. But that other seeds will hit fertile ground and be deeply rooted and flourish and blossom and grow. Now, what am I talking about here? I'm referring to those seeds of God that get planted in us, and then what happens? Well, we can do things like uh, start to learn and grow as I did when I first had this spark. And that works wonderfully. We have books, uh, book studies, a bookstore. We have meditation groups. We have a lot of things. But there's one process that works better than any. in getting that seed deeply rooted. And it's what I call a wilderness experience. Anybody had a wilderness experience? It's part of the human condition. And what does a wilderness experience look like? Well, very easily. You've lost a child. Horrible grief. You've lost a spouse or a partner, either because they died or they walked away on you. And you're left devastated, wondering what's going to happen next. You have financial hardships, uh, medical hardships, um, hopelessness. Uh, there are any, you know, just plain old bummer life experiences. <laughs> there are lots of different wilderness experiences, and some of them can wear on us. Maybe they're not big events, but they're events that just go on and on and on, like maybe financial struggles or a relationship that isn't working out or a health condition that won't resolve. But whatever it is, this seed that we are, 
as human beings, we feel like we are being sucked down into a vortex of mud and muck, right? Now, what happens next? Generally, we're at that bottom point when we think surely we cannot take any more at all, not another bit of it. And next, life comes along and dumps another great big load of manure on top of us. <laughs> now, what do we know from a farming family about manure? It is the greatest fertilizer. It gets all hot and stinky, and the little seed under there has no, no, nothing to do, no way out besides reach up towards the light and grow. And this is where the deepest seeding of our practicing the presence of God occurs. Right there when we are in the mud and muck of it and all the stuff is piling on. That's where we have to cry out. It says a voice cries out in the universe, make straight a highway to God. Make straight a highway to God. It doesn't say to dally around or hang around or talk about our misery. It says to make straight that highway. How do we do that? How do we reach for that light? Well, there's a, many different ways, but the way I like to look at it is sort of like the old game Monopoly. Run for the border, you know, pass, go. In this case, you run for God, pass, go, hold out your hand, collect your $200 of spiritual currency for the day, make your way around the board, go back, refill, please, and do it again. And by the way, you must play daily in order to win. Because in order to capture and maintain and sustain the presence of God, it must be practiced, 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 right? So we have the knowing, the knowledge of it, and then doing, practice, practice, practice. And the last piece of it is being, but there are some things in between that that we must do. I know uh, the priest uh, who I had that experience through that day, I became friends with him. I had to know this man. And I remember I was going through one of my stuck-in-the-mud experiences, and I went to visit him one time. And I'm like, I don't understand. I've gone through this. I don't know why there's more. Because I was getting the second round, the piling on. And he looked at me, and he said, Jane, in order for clay to turn into a utilitarian vessel. First, it must be formed out of that muddy mass, then put it in an oven, and then come out. And of course, I think, well, yeah, that's what I've been through. And he goes, ah, but next we have the glazing process. <laughs> Glazed and put back into a 2,000 degree kiln, something like that, in order for that vessel to be utilitarian. And I really do believe that that is how our higher power works with us most of the time. We don't get to that place where we have that presence, that, that conscious presence of the power of God within us, unless we've been glazed, <laughs> then we can go and uh, work uh, God through ourselves in our world. You know, <clears throat> there is a story of a great violinist. You may have heard this. He was a very young man, just barely seven years old. And he had the experience of being in the presence of a great violinist. And he, and he heard the performance and something hit him. I think his kindling was sparked. And so he said, God, I've, I've got to know more about this. I've got to do this. And so he went and got his, all of his money he had saved up from all of his little gifts as a child and went to the bookstore and got a book on the history of violins and how they were made and who originally created them. And he studied that. And then he got a book of music, sheet music for violins, and he read that and studied that and got all over it. He went to his parents and, and, and begged them to buy him a violin, and they got him the violin. And, and so now he's got, he's read the books, he's read the music, he's got the violin in his hand. And all this took about a month. And uh, shortly thereafter, just a few weeks later, he walks up to the business office of Carnegie Hall, tells him he wants to perform there talks him into it. They place him on the bill. He's, he sits up there, pulls out his violin, having never struck a string, and plays beautiful music of the spheres. Is this how it works? No. No, no. Not at all. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. 
And, and what I find over and over on the spiritual path and finding this pathway to God is that people want to try something once or twice, or they read about it and have knowledge about it, and we want to talk about it, but until we've done it and practice, 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 nothing really happens, right? But what if he did master that violin? I know my husband, Norman, is a musician, and it always amazes me because, you know, we go around, we're, we're just normal people going around doing our business and our lives, and then I go to see him perform, as I did last night, and, and the music that comes out of him just amazes me. You know, but he's done it long enough that it's part of him. It has become him. And just like anything else, if we do something over and over and over, if we practice something over and over and over, it becomes us. And that is what practicing the presence of God gives us, being in that, being godless, being gods and goddesses walking the earth, being in that state of beingness. And that way then, when our little shoot comes up through that mud, muck, and debris and shines its light, we can lend our fragrance to all who pass by without even knowing it. And maybe someone else's spark too, because that's how it works. So, in conclusion, I just want to tie it together to remember to seek first the kingdom of God and all things are added to us. And don't you know you are God's? Don't you know you are God's? That is what Christ told us over and over. All these things I do, you can do, and more. Don't you know you are God's? And that's what we do after we're in that wonderful presence of God. Then we can hold our thoughts and visions, and they become manifest reality in the outer world. And that is beauty. We are co-creators. And as a community right now, we are using our mass consciousness of the presence of God to hold the vision of a dynamic, powerful minister that will come right here and be our guide. And so it is.